Today is day three for the Come Follow Me study for this week, September 30th through October 6th. I am the law and the light. 3 Nephi 12 through 16. Wednesday, October 2nd, 2024, 3 Nephi 12, 27 through 48 in chapter 13. Look for the theme of the Savior's invitation to live a higher law when the Savior speaks of immorality. 3 Nephi 12, 27 through 28. Behold, it is written by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. Elder Richard G. Scott contrasted both the results and motivation of love versus those of lust. Love, as defined by the Lord, elevates, protects, respects, and enriches another. It motivates one to make sacrifices for another. Satan promotes counterfeit love, which is lust. It is driven by a hunger to appease personal appetite. One who practices this deception cares little for the pain and destruction caused another. While often camouflaged by flattering words, its motivation is self-gratification. 3 Nephi 12, 29 Behold, I give unto you a commandment, that ye suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. 4. Suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. The Book of Mormon account completely drops the biblical command, If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. These verses in the New Testament, which are obviously symbolical admonitions, have raised many questions among Bible readers. The Book of Mormon account clarifies the intended meaning of how one avoids lust. Suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. Deny yourselves of these things. The Savior's statement can also better be understood through Book of Mormon examples of how a true saint accepts persecution. We are to accept suffering and persecution patiently, prayerfully, and humbly. 3 Nephi 1230 For it is better that ye should deny yourselves of these things, wherein ye will take up your cross, than that ye should be cast into hell. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the phrase, Take up your cross. The daily taking up of the cross means daily denying ourselves the appetites of the flesh by emulating the master who endured temptations but gave no heed unto them. We too can live in a world filled with temptations such as are common to man. Of course, Jesus noticed the tremendous temptations that came to him, but he did not process and reprocess them. Instead, he rejected them promptly. If we entertain temptations, soon they begin entertaining us. Turning these unwanted lodgers away at the doorstep of the mind is one way of giving no heed. Besides, these would-be lodgers are actually barbarians, who, if admitted, can be evicted only with great trauma. What can you do to purify the desires of your heart? 3 Nephi 12, 31-32 It hath been written that whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whoso shall marry her, who is divorced, committeth adultery. Elder Bruce M. McConkie described who the Savior here was speaking to and how it applies to us today. This strict law governing divorce was not given to the Pharisees nor to the world in general but to the disciples only, in the house, at a later time, as Mark explains. Further, Jesus expressly limited its application. All men could not live such a high standard. It applied only to those to whom it is given. It may have been in force at various times and among various people, but the church is not bound by it today. At this time, divorces are permitted in the church for a number of reasons other than sex and morality, and divorced persons are permitted to marry again and enjoy all the blessings of the gospel. It would appear that one of the purposes of the Savior's words was not to condemn those who marry divorced people, but to teach the people not to turn to divorce as the solution to all the minor irritations that come up in marriage. In speaking about divorce, President Gordon B. Hinckley has taught, Among the greatest of tragedies, and I think the most common, is divorce. It has become as a great scourge. Selfishness so often is the basis of problems. 
Too many who come to marriage have been coddled and spoiled and somehow led to feel that everything must be precisely right at all times, that life is a series of entertainments, that appetites are to be satisfied without regard to principle. How tragic the consequences of such hollow and unreasonable thinking. The remedy of most marriage stress is not in divorce. It is in repentance. It is not in separation. It is in simple integrity that leads a man to square up his shoulders and meet his obligations. It is found in the golden rule. There must be a willingness to overlook small faults, to forgive, and then to forget. There must be a holding of one's tongue. Temper is a vicious and corrosive thing that destroys affection and casts out love. There must be self-discipline that constrains against abuse. There may be now and again a legitimate cause for divorce. I am not one to say that it is ever justified, but I say without hesitation that this plague among us, which seems to be growing everywhere, is not of God, but rather is the work of the adversary of righteousness in peace and truth. 3 Nephi 12, 33-39 And again it is written, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But verily, verily, I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair black or white. But let your communication be yea, yea, or nay, nay. For whatsoever cometh of more than these is evil. And behold, it is written, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye shall not resist evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. The Savior's intended meaning of this statement has been further clarified in the Book of Mormon. Here are examples of how a true saint accepts persecution are given. We, therefore, are to accept suffering and persecution patiently and humbly. The Joseph Smith translation for Luke 6 says, And unto him who smiteth thee on the cheek, offer also the other. Or in other words, it is better to offer the other than to revile again. And him who taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. For it is better that thou suffer thine enemy to take these things than to contend with him. Verily I say unto you, your heavenly Father, who seeth in secret, shall bring that wicked one into judgment. Third Nephi 12, 40-42 And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. The Master taught us that whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Some of the most rewarding times of our lives are those extra mile hours given in the service when the body says it wants to relax, but our better self emerges and said, Here am I, send me. 3 Nephi 12, 43-44 And behold, it is written also, that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But behold, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Summarize 3 Nephi 12, 38-44 in one sentence. True Disciples of Jesus Christ, blank. Third Nephi 12, 45-48 That ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. Therefore those things which were of old time, which were under the law in me, are all fulfilled. Old things are done away, and all things have become new. Therefore, I would that ye should be perfect, even as I, or your Father who is in heaven, is perfect. It is written by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery. But whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. I give unto you a commandment that ye suffer none of these things to enter into your heart. For it is better that ye should deny yourselves of these things wherein ye will take up your cross than that ye should be cast into hell. And it is written also that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, 
love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. Those things which were of old time, which were under the law, in me are all fulfilled. Old things are done away, and all things have become new. Therefore I would that ye should be perfect, even as I or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Five, I would that ye should be perfect. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith commented on this perfection. Those who receive exaltation in the celestial kingdom are promised the fullness thereof. All things are theirs, whether life or death or things present or things to come. Our Father in heaven is infinite. He is perfect. He possesses all knowledge and wisdom. However, he is not jealous of his wisdom and perfection, but glories in the fact that it is possible for his children to obey him in all things and endure to the end to become like him. Man has within him the power which the Father has bestowed upon him, so to develop in truth, faith, wisdom, and all the virtues, that eventually he shall become like the Father and the Son. This virtue, wisdom, and knowledge on the part of the faithful does not rob the Father and the Son, but adds to their glory and dominion. Thus it is destined that those who are worthy to become his sons and joint heirs with our Redeemer would be heirs of the Father's kingdom, possessing the same attributes in their perfection as the Father and the Son now possess. President Spencer W. Kimball also explained the need to strive for perfection. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now that is an attainable goal. We will not be exalted. We shall not reach our destination unless we are perfect. And now is the best time in the world to start toward perfection. I have little patience with persons who say, oh, nobody is perfect. The implication being, so why try? Of course, no one is wholly perfect, but we find some who are a long way up the ladder. In both his old and new world ministries, the Savior commanded, Be ye therefore perfect. A footnote explains that the Greek word translated as perfect means complete, finished, fully developed. Our Heavenly Father wants us to use this mortal probation to fully develop ourselves, to make the most of our talents and abilities. If we do so, when final judgment comes, we will experience the joy of standing before our Father in Heaven in the final judgment as complete and finished sons and daughters, polished by obedience and worthy of the inheritance that He has promised to the faithful. Chapter 13 Jesus teaches the Nephites the Lord's Prayer. They are to lay up treasures in heaven. The twelve disciples in their ministry are commanded to take no thought for temporal things. Compare Matthew 6. About 34 A.D. Alms and prayers are to be performed for the right reasons. These verses in 3 Nephi teach about avoiding the giving of money to the poor openly, or praying and fasting openly to be seen of others. The Lord encourages us to practice righteousness in private. President Thomas S. Mawson explained the value of anonymous service. I approached the reception desk of a large hospital to learn the room number of a patient I had come to visit. This hospital, like almost every other in the land, was undergoing a massive expansion. Behind the desk where the receptionist sat was a magnificent plaque which bore an inscription of thanks to donors who had made possible the expansion. The name of each donor who had contributed $100,000 appeared in a flowing script, etched on an individual brass placard suspended from the main plaque by a glittering chain. The names of the benefactors were well known. Captains of commerce, giants of industry, professors of learning, all were there. I felt gratitude for their charitable benevolence. Then my eyes rested on a brass placard, which was different. It contained no name. One word and one word only was inscribed, anonymous. I smiled and wondered who the unknown contributor could have been. Surely he or she experienced a quiet joy unknown to any other. A year ago, last winter, 1991, a modern jetliner faltered after takeoff and plunged into the icy Potomac River. Acts of bravery and feats of heroism were in evidence that day. 
the most dramatic of which was one witnessed by the pilot of a rescue helicopter. The rescue rope was lowered to a struggling survivor. Rather than grasping the lifeline to safety, the man tied the line to another, who was then lifted to safety. The rope was lowered again, and yet another was saved. Five were rescued from the icy waters. Among them was not found the anonymous hero. Unknown by name, he left the vivid air signed with his honor. May this truth or service guide our lives. May we look upward as we press forward in the service of our God and our fellow men. And may we incline an ear toward Galilee, that we might hear perhaps an echo of the Savior's teachings. Do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. And of our good deeds, see thou tell no man. Our hearts will then be lighter, our lives brighter, and our souls richer. Loving service anonymously given may be unknown to man, but the gift and the giver are known to God. 3 Nephi 13.1 Verily, verily, I say that I would that ye should do alms unto the poor. But take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father who is in heaven. Moroni 7 God hath said, A man being evil cannot do that which is good. For if he offereth a gift, or prayeth unto God, except he shall do it with real intent to profit him nothing. For behold, it is not counted unto him for righteousness. 3 Nephi 13, 2-4 Therefore, when ye shall do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as will hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father who seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Look for this theme of the Savior's invitation to live a higher law when the Savior speaks of prayer. 3 Nephi 13.5 And when thou prayest, thou shalt not do as the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. Daniel Tyler, an associate of the prophet, recalled an important occasion. At the time William Smith and others rebelled against the prophet at Kirtland, I attended a meeting where Joseph presided. Entering the schoolhouse a little before the meeting opened and gazing upon the man of God, I perceived sadness in his countenance and tears trickling down his cheeks. A few moments later, a hymn was sung, and he opened the meeting by prayer. Instead of facing the audience, however, he turned his back and bowed upon his knees, facing the wall. This, I suppose, was done to hide his sorrow and tears. I had heard men and women pray, especially the former, from the most ignorant, both as to letters and intellect, to the most learned and eloquent. But never until then had I heard a man address his maker as though he was present, listening as a kind father would listen to the sorrows of a dutiful child. Joseph was at that time unlearned, but that prayer, which was a considerable extent in behalf of those who accused him of having gone astray and fallen into sin, was that the Lord would forgive them and open their eyes, that they might see aright. That prayer, I say, to my humble mind, partook of the learning and eloquence of heaven. There was no ostentation, no raising of the voice as by enthusiasm, but a plain conversational tone as a man would address a present friend. It appeared to me as though, in case the veil were taken away, I could see the Lord standing facing his humblest of all servants I had ever seen. It was the crowning of all the prayers I ever heard. 3 Nephi 13, 6-7 But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father who is in secret, and thy father who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray... Use not vain repetitions, as the heathen, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. 6. Vain repetitions. The word vain means empty, hollow, deceiving, lacking genuineness. Vain means empty, worthless, having no substance, value, or importance. 
Vain repetitions in prayer can refer to words or phrases that are used without real thought, feeling, or meaning. It can also refer to set prayers that are repeated over and over. An example is the Zoramites' rote prayer from the Ramiumpton, which was thoughtlessly repeated each week. Our prayers are vain when we offer them out of habit with little thought or feeling. The prophet Mormon warned that if anyone shall pray and not with real intent of heart, it profiteth him nothing, for God receiveth none such. To make your prayers meaningful, you must pray with sincerity and with all the energy of heart. Give serious thought to your attitude and to the words you use. Elder Joseph B. Worthland cautioned regarding repetition in prayer. Our prayers become hollow when we say similar words in similar ways over and over so often that the words become more of a resuscitation than a communication. This is what the Savior described as vain repetitions. 3 Nephi 13, 8 Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Romans 8 Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What can you do to purify the desires of your heart? A summary of 3 Nephi 13, 1-8 through 8 might be, True disciples of Jesus Christ don't seek public praise for doing good. Jesus provides a pattern for prayer. 3 Nephi 13, 9-12 After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Joseph Smith translation from Matthew 6, Suffer us not to be led into temptation. 3 Nephi 13, 13 For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When thou prayest, thou shalt not do so to be seen of men. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father who is in secret. And thy Father who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. After this manner therefore pray ye. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Seven, the Lord's Prayer. The prayer Jesus offered here drops the phrase, Thy kingdom come. Doctrine and Covenant 65, call upon the Lord, that his kingdom may go forth upon the earth, that the inhabitants thereof may receive it, and be prepared for the days to come, in the which the Son of Man shall come down in heaven, clothed with the brightness of his glory, to meet the kingdom of God which is set upon the earth. Wherefore, may the kingdom of God go forth, that the kingdom of heaven may come, that thou, O God, mayest be glorified in heaven so on earth, that thine enemies shall be subdued. For thine is the honor, power, and glory for ever and ever. Amen. What principles for effective prayer does the Savior teach in these verses? We can use the principles in the Lord's Prayer as a model for our service in the kingdom. President Henry B. Iring of the First Presidency taught, The prayer begins with reverence for our Heavenly Father. Then the Lord speaks of the kingdom and its coming. The servant with a testimony that this is the true church of Jesus Christ feels joy in its progress and a desire to give his or her all to build it up. The Savior himself exemplified the standard set by these next words of the prayer, Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. 
That was his prayer in the extremity of offering the atonement of all mankind and all the world. The faithful servants prayed that even the apparently smallest task would be done as God would have it done. It makes all the difference to work and to pray for his success more than for our own. Then the Savior set for us this standard for personal purity. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The strengthening we are to give those we watch over comes from the Savior. We and they must forgive to be forgiven by him. We and they can hope to remain clean only with his protection and with the change in our hearts that his atonement makes possible. We need that change to have the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost. You may have confidence in the Lord's service. The Savior will help you do what he has called you to do, be it for a time as a worker in the church or forever as a parent. You may pray for help enough to do the work and know that it will come. 3 Nephi 13, 14-15 For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Doctrine and Covenants 64 My disciples in days of old sought occasion against one another and forgave not one another in their hearts. And for this evil they were afflicted and sorely chastened. Wherefore I say unto you that ye ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses stands condemned before the Lord. For there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is required to forgive all men. And ye ought to say in your hearts, Let God judge between me and thee, and reward thee according to thy deeds. Fasting is to be done for the right reasons. Look for this theme of the Savior's invitation to live a higher law when the Savior speaks of fasting. 3 Nephi 13, 16 through 18. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father who is in secret. And thy Father, who seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. What can you do to purify the desires of your heart? An eye single to the glory of God. 3 Nephi 13, 19 Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves break through and steal. Luke 12 And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto him, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do, I will put down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. 3 Nephi 13, 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. President Ezra Taft Benson, referring to the temporary nature of earthly treasure, said, Our affections are often too highly placed on the paltry perishable objects. Material treasures of earth are merely to provide us, as it were, room and board, while we are here at school. It is for us to place gold, silver, houses, stocks, lands, cattle, and other earthly possessions in their proper place. Yes, this is but a place of temporary duration. We are here to learn the first lesson toward exaltation, obedience to the Lord's gospel plan. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles gave insight regarding the treasures we may lay up for ourselves. 
the Savior taught that we should not lay up treasures on earth, but should lay up treasures in heaven. In light of the ultimate purpose of the great plan of happiness, I believe that the ultimate treasures on earth and in heaven are our children and our posterity. 3 Nephi 13, 21 For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Reading these verses could prompt a discussion about the things we treasure. Maybe you could lead your children on a treasure hunt to find things that remind them of treasures with eternal value. 3 Nephi 13, 22 The light of the body is the eye. If, therefore, thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Doctrine and Covenants 88 And if your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you. And that body which is filled with light comprehendeth all things. Elder Orson Hyde said, If thine eye were single, thou mightest sometimes see through the veil. 3 Nephi 13.23 But if thine eye be evil, Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. Doctrine and Covenants 88 Therefore, sanctify yourselves, that your minds become single to God. And the days will come that you shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto you. And it shall be in his own time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. 3 Nephi 13, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, There neither are nor can there be any neutrals in this war. Every member of the church is on one side or the other. In this war, all who do not stand forth courageously and valiantly are by that fact alone aiding the cause of the enemy. They who are not for me are against me, saith our God. We are either for the church or we are against it. We either take its part or we take the consequences. We cannot survive spiritually with one foot in the church and the other in the world. We must make the choice. It is either the church or the world. There is no middle ground. Summarize 3 Nephi 13, 19-24 in one sentence. True Disciples of Jesus Christ, blank. 3 Nephi 13, 25-29 And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he looked upon the twelve whom he had chosen, and said unto them, Remember the words which I have spoken, for behold, ye are they whom I have chosen to minister unto this people. Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 3 Nephi 13, 30-33 Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, even so will he clothe you, if ye are not of little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth, that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Analyze your motives to determine whether or not you are seeking first the kingdom of God. Third Nephi 13.34 Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself.
Remember the words which I have spoken. For behold, ye are they whom I have chosen to minister unto this people. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Eight, take no thought for the morrow. The Book of Mormon clarifies the meaning of Matthew 6, 25 to 32 by indicating that Jesus was speaking to the 12 Nephite disciples for this portion of the sermon. After Jesus delivered this charge to them, he then turned and began to speak to the multitude again. It is helpful to note that Jesus repeatedly turned back and forth between these two audiences throughout his sermon. 3 Nephi 13, 34 continued, Sufficient is the day unto the evil thereof. President Brigham Young said, The men and women who desire to obtain seats in the celestial kingdom will find that they must battle with the enemy of all righteousness every day.